it's a lot of time, but at the end of the day, because, I mean, you and I have both been out in conditions that were way, <laughs> no, way too windy. <laughs> no good, no good can come of this kind of wind. Mm-hmm. Welcome back to the Aviation RC New Podcast. You found us. My name is Joe. And I'm Matt. We're here to be with you along your journey and to share our experiences in RC Aviation. If you have any questions, thoughts, or want to share a flight story, hit us up at aviationrcnoob at gmail.com. Now, buckle in. Let's take off. It's episode 48. It's too windy. Uh, so this week, uh, Joe and I are going to sit down and talk uh, about the history lesson that we uh, put together the previous week when we were talking to Lee. Say um, that one again. What? Previously. Previously? I said privacy. Lee. Yeah, there was an A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll throw extra letters. It's like it's like vegetables. It's okay if you add a couple extra types in. <laughs> okay. Lima beans, string beans. It's all good. They're beans. They're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Put some carrots in there. A little bit of corn. Anyway, <laughs> you know, not all the letters, you know, it's, you just make it up as you go. Okay. Um, no, but basically I, uh, I put together like a little, the history of the quadcopter. Cause we were talking to Lee about quadcopters last time. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it would be an, uh, an appropriate, uh, thing to add. And I realized <laughs> that we, we don't have time for that. Not 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 last time, which no. it was a blast being able to sit down and talk yeah, with Lee. That was a um, real treat. You know, and Lee, if you're listening, thank you again yeah. for coming on and giving us your valuable time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through that history. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what we've been up to, which uh, may be a lot shorter than I think we want, which kind of gets to the point. And what I realized, I was thinking about, well, why is it that, you know, I don't have a whole lot to talk about and... I don't know. And I imagine, Joe, you're kind of in a similar boat in the sense that the couple days you might have had were probably too windy because they were windy for me here. Um, we're close enough in geographic location that we tend to see similar weather patterns. We tend to. Um, that said, this past weekend I was out of town. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I may have mentioned it last episode, but LARP season has fired Ooh, back up. baby. Yep, so that's yep. going to be a weekend a month. Yeah. And, you know, again, we've been busy. This is uh, coming up on uh, baseball season. To see the, we went from basketball season to baseball season, and all the seasons overlapped. So we were mm -hmm. every night, every week. And then when we weren't doing that, it was get the homework done and do the thing. And then I had my mother come up. Anyway, so it Man, got busy like for both you're of us. It's like a dad or something. I know. I, I try not <laughs> to be, and I try to act like a six year old, but, you know, sometimes you just can't escape it. That's right. <laughs> Anyway, and so what we're going to talk about is, well, what, you know, what happens when you, uh, it's either too windy to do anything or you get out to the field. Like I'll come outside of my house and I'll go, okay, this looks like it. I can fly a plane. And I get out to the field and go, there's no I way can't I can fly, fly a plane this. in this. No. <laughs> or I shouldn't. And then we'll, we'll talk about that. So kind of what to do, uh, to, to either mitigate how often that happens or what to do in the meantime, yeah, it'll feel like you're doing something productive or uh, maybe doing some things you might enjoy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we'll have some options there. And some of these may, we may have covered a little bit of it before in kind of a different tact, uh, but we'll, we'll touch on some of them again. Anyway, so uh, without further ado, why don't we talk about what kind of nonsense we got up to in the last couple weeks? What about um, you, Joe? Sure. Uh, well, I said last weekend was LARP. Uh, you and I are actually sitting down. Tonight's a Wednesday night. We normally sit yeah. down on Monday night. Yeah, it was um, full full weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just I Monday and Tuesday it. nights got shot. So we're kind of up against the the timer on this one. Um, mm -hmm. I was out of town for the weekend. I forget what all I was doing last week. I'm sure it was something. Ah, uh, um, yeah, you're probably pretty busy. But um, I, I really actually had uh, had in mind to come home from work Monday before we were going to sit down and record and at mm -hmm. least grab the seven and slap a couple servos in it. So I could say that I did something. Yeah. Right. Cause Got it really, it just, ready. yeah, it just, it really just needs electronics. 
Yeah. Um, but no. So. Okay. Um, been watching the Discord. That's probably about it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's been pretty active, and that's been actually a lot of fun to kind of follow. Uh, so yeah, and that that does take does keep you in the hobby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, good. Uh, me, let's see. Last time I went out, it was way too windy. I mean, unhealthily too windy, and I decided because I needed to feel like I was doing something. I took out the Prandtl D, and I knew it was windy, so I was like, well, a wing usually flies okay in the wind if it doesn't fly not okay. Like, if you can get it up in there, <laughs> you can do okay. And then I, I brought out the uh, Texan, and because that's just an all-around good flyer, and if I can get it in the air, I know I'll be able to work with it. Right. Well, needless to say, uh, it was a mistake. I should have mm. not... Uh, thrown anything in the air. I should have pulled out any of the options we'll talk about later and done those instead. Any one of them would have been a better choice. But I, th- I threw that T6 and T6 Texan into the ground probably like three times. <laughs> I was like, oh, I got to stop. Uh, and I, I, what, I, what I ended up doing was messing up the, the power pod itself. And I think that was it, thankfully. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was good. And then and you can't take much more of this, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I had Scotty yelling at me. Um, <laughs> and then uh, with the Prandtl D, I cut the what was it? The um, BEC. I have an independent BEC, which was mm-hmm. part of the reason why there was an issue at Flight Fest last year. Right. Well, I, I cut the wire on that because it, it came loose and went through the prop and. Yeah, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that was you the would think that was with the that, second with throw. That blow an air backwards. Yeah. Is the prop front mounted or rear mounted? It's, it's rear mounted. It's a push. Oh, okay. Never mind. It's like a Horton okay. kind of wing setup. I was like, it was a tractor, in which case it should have blown the wire backwards, not sucked it in. But. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's. All a right, bit. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, and I, like, as I threw it the second time and that happened, I went, you know, I'm glad it wasn't more and it serves me right. I just need to put these in the car and go. <laughs> and, you know, I was oddly satisfied that I had tried. Yeah. And that was enough for me that day. It was a mistake anyway. But, uh, you know, uh, I had worked a little bit on some of the P 61, uh, issues, uh, a little bit trying to suss out what the issue is. And I still haven't quite gotten to the bottom of it. I still may need to switch out the B, uh, the ESC on the one motor. Um, I'm still haven't ruled out everything. So, uh, we'll do that. Um, well, as far as windy days go, uh, like, I mean, we're talking I'm, the sock was straight out when I went. Yeah, and <laughs> I just, I don't know. On some level, I find it humorous and uh, hard to believe that, yeah, like I'll, I've talked to Ron before and, you know, flying balsa, and he'll kind of describe what, what wind conditions he's not comfortable flying in. And it was just like, oh, yeah, we'll just, you know, we go out there and we chuck our plane into it. And it's, why are we like so willing to, but then it, it also dawns on me we're flying foam board. Like, right. It's a lot of time, but at the end of the day, but cause I mean, you and I have both been out in conditions that were way, <laughs> no, way too windy. <laughs> no good. No good can come of this kind of wind. Mm-hmm. You know, I really, what we would need would be another like three pounds of airplane. Honestly. As you well, need a heavier bird. But really even come. still, and, and that was sort of my thought, too, with the balsa stuff. Like, maybe if we were flying balsa, we could fly in these windy conditions. Yeah. But kind of what I'm hearing is, no, because no. no. the wind, like, you still have an airfoil that's yep. going to grab that grab that uh, wind and get turned. You know? <laughs> yeah, if it starts turning awful uh, and starts to become a billboard, uh, you're in trouble. Yeah. And there's no way out of it, really. You mm-hmm. just basically have to do the backflip and hope you can come back into the wind again and in time before you hit the ground, you know? And that's that's kind of what I was doing with the Prandtl. Like, I launched it, and it would start to flip back, and I'm like, okay, let's hope if I can do the flip. And it, it obviously I couldn't. But, um, yeah, no, balsa doesn't seem to – it seems like – I mean, balsa builders tend to be far more careful and more selective about the winds they'll fly in. And like you said, it's you know, the difference between the time and effort – 
And in some cases right now, the availability of the materials. You know, this is true. Foam board is easy to get. Also, you can put an order in and you'll see it in six months or a year. Um, you know, and it takes a while to build. The last thing you want to do is almost literally, like I did, throw it. It might as well have been me throwing planes into the ground a couple of times, <laughs> you know. And I, you know, whatever. I, I knew I knew what I was doing and I knew that these are my choices mm -hmm. uh, at the time. I, you know what I ended up doing, though? Um, What's that? I had printed out, I kind of took the the minimum, uh, minimum RC Star Voyager that I think on National RC Day I, I attempted to fly. And I got, I got flying. It was actually a fun, slow flyer. Uh, I made a bigger version so I could use a BPAC motor, these, uh, the things that were used in the uh, challenge, um, the challenge we just finished. Why am I blanking on Sam's company? Oh, uh, uh, the Hangar RC. Thank you. The Hangar RC's um, challenge, you know, the to a 1,400 kV, um, it's 20, 22, 12 motors, those little orange can motors. Anyway, so I built it for like an eight inch prop and I kind of sized it up. So mm -hmm. instead of being this little like three inch, you know, can motor, uh, we were using something a little bit more powerful. So I scaled it up and I, I cut it out um, and I put it together. And so I'm now in the process of putting tape on it and getting the electronics in. So I got it that far and it looks really good. And I actually thought of, because it's set up to be looking like a junker, uh, like a junk boat, a Chinese junk boat. That's just okay. the name of the, it's actually called a junker. Um, so for whatever that's worth, uh, it's not a slander or anything like that. Um, so what I was looking at is, well, how could I change the, basically the same design and turn it into, an, I'll call it a, a Western boat. Um, and I think I, I found that I could probably make it a catch, uh, K-E-T-C-H catch um and they have uh, typically twin mast with front triangular sails like two or three of them and then they'll have these kind of uh trapezoidal sails out the back okay and so i created like you know an alternate so you could do it like the original uh or you could do it more like a western style um and so uh anyway so i've got that set up and <clears throat> so i'm gonna get some electronics in it when i get a minute um and then I realized uh, I've got a fly-in coming up this weekend, and it is a warbird fly-in. So I'm going to pull down my Mustang. I'll probably take out some triangular uh, dark black tape and do the razzle-dazzle uh, paint scheme on it. Okay. Uh, because that's just a series of black and white triangles and these kind of opposing, I don't know, whatever patterns. And, th and the whole point of those is that you couldn't see if it was coming or going, and you couldn't really determine its silhouette especially if you had multiple near each other. It was for targeting issues uh, with uh, battles, battleships mostly, but they decided to try it out on aerial vehicles as well for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I was going to put that on because that would be relatively quick and easy, and then it would feel like it's a, I'll call it a finished product. Um, and I was going to get the P61 tested and, and try to get that before Saturday. And I, as we have Friday off, to, was it not tomorrow, but the day after, uh, I might be able to do get that completed, get it nice. tested. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's come up. That's going to be exciting. And with any luck, next time we talk uh, here, I'll be able to tell everybody how the flying went. It should be a fun. Good. Oh, oh, yeah. I went to uh, one of the club meetings. And every once in a while, one of the guys who's building something will just sit down with their photo album of all the things that they, you know, as they were working on it, they took a lot of photos. Well, one guy is doing, it looks like a fifth scale. It may even be a quarter scale BG. Sorry, okay. GB, GB, my mistake. I do that every time. BGs sing, GBs don't. And GBs fly. GB. Um, yeah, uh, look it up. It's a little racer. It's all engine, little wing, all about going as fast as you possibly can. Looks almost cartoonish, really. Oh, yeah, we talked about those. Okay. Yeah, we did. Uh, but so he's building one, but it's like quarter scale out of Balsa. Okay. And it's stunning. I mean, this guy, you know, he's probably 20 years older than me. He's been building Balsa since he was probably a boy. And he has some serious talent. And he's putting some serious money into it, too. He's like, oh, the landing gear, they cost like 700 bucks. 
you know, custom kind of deal, but they look great and they, and, and they do, they, they function amazing. Like it's awesome. I can't wait to see it in the air. And that's what they were hoping that he'll be out in the, this weekend to be able to kind of give it a, uh, if not this one, then maybe the next time we have a fly and have them out and have them show it off. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's gorgeous. I'm looking forward to it. But I was sitting there asking, I'm like, what? You know, I'm the only guy asking questions because I'm the only guy who has no idea what balsa, like how to how to do balsa. So I'm like, what'd you do there? How'd you use that? What's it all up? Wait. I mean, he says it's over, it's going to be over four, uh, 55 pounds. Wow. So he just doesn't think it's going to cut up, come under. Because I'm like, that's a lot of balsa. Because he's skinning the whole thing in balsa strips. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Before he puts the, the, sh- the I'll call it the, the shrink, but the ultra coat. Yeah. You know, so he's, you know, it's a fiberglass cowl with a, I think it's a 3D printed or a blow mold, blow molded faux engine. Uh, And he's got a gas engine in it with two piston, you know, big guy swinging, I think a 20, no, like a 30 inch prop or something. Like it's, you know, (laughs) it's a big, it's a, could be a big plane. It's cool. It was just really neat. That was one of those things that I'm so glad I went. Uh, I, I had a choice between, um, you know, it's the end of the scout season. So doing scouting, the you know, scouting leadership stuff or doing um, the RC hobby meeting. And I was like, I'm going to go to the RC hobby meeting this time. I'm glad it is <laughs> really cool. So, hey, if you, ha- if you belong to a local club, go to your meetings, you know, take part, help, uh, help get events out there, help bring those events, uh, awareness to people in your neighborhood and people in your, in your, area so that yeah anybody you know that's the only way you're going to grow the hobbies by people knowing it's there Mm -hmm. this is true anyway okay so i guess that brings us to our community section so let's talk about uh, do we have any feedback and then what are the what events do we have coming up and and that kind of stuff you want to yeah so uh we had a comment come in on discord and then we had a comment come in via email. We'll talk about the email first. Um, so, um, looking for the name. Uh, Captain here. Glover. Captain Glover, Michael Kowelty. Sorry. I was looking through it. I was like, man, where's the signature line? <laughs> well, um, he emailed in and said, hey, guys, love the show. Informative, congenial, and passionate on a subject I love. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. As a maker, I love building, uh, building dash repairing flight test planes and foamies. I truly enjoy you sharing your journey. I would like to offer a suggestion. As a student of history, let me offer a different way of pronouncing the word for aircraft paint schemes. Livery was first used as a term in heraldry and for the uniforms of household servants, butlers, coachmen, etc. Which is, you and I, Joe, well know that. We, we know better. Yeah. I, I mean, I want to... Okay, let me get through this, then we'll talk. Uh, but I mean, per- we, know, we know that from playing tons of D&D, you can't go through a couple sessions without going to the king and saying, oh, they're wearing so-and-so's uh, livery. Mm-hmm. Or I've heard it a bunch of different ways. Right. Uh, which he's clarifying for us. Uh, it is pronounced uh, as in live it up, so livery, not as in live performance, library. Right. And I think in the last episode that we spoke about it, I think we one of us called it livery by accident. I don't know. I won't blame both, you. I'm not. Um... I, well, then I'll own it. I, I misspoke. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I don't know. I know better. I know it's livery. Yeah, I like to think I wouldn't make that mistake. But, but didn't, we I don't didn't. Know. <laughs> but didn't we? Didn't we just go over how I add letters while I'm speaking sometimes? <laughs> so you know. You know what? I I've put said, it past myself. Yeah, but I've said some dumb things and mispronounced. It's like, <laughs> oh man, have you have you seen the video where they're spelling out like the the they have the person spell out or pronounce these three letter combinations? Okay, T W A T W I, and then they go to T W two T W O, and they want to say two 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 is a two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I like, haven't, yeah, yeah, it's right. It's easy to kind of get caught up in a pattern and just go with it. Yeah. So anyway, he says, keep up the great content. Maybe I'll make out a build night sometime. Uh, Michael Kowalty, Kowalty, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, a.k.a. Captain Glover. Awesome. 
Well, thank you, uh, Michael, for writing in. Um, oh, thank you. And truly, it could have been either one of us that said that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's it's livery. So next time when you're putting on the little roundels um, mm. that go on the thing and you're making it a certain uh, Air Force, uh, well, livery specifically, um, yeah, that's what you call it. So don't mess up like we do. I would catch so much flack if I was the one that actually said library. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, but like I said, we you know, we've played D and D so often that I mean, you know how many word like uh, a raised uh, dais. I've heard it mispronounced a bunch of times. Dais, dais, days. Yeah, yeah. And you're just yeah. like, well, that's only there's only one way. But I get we. It doesn't matter. You know, mm. I know what you're talking about. It's the raised thing in the middle where you put the thrones. Got it. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of words in we'll call it history and medieval history specifically um, that have very unusual pronunciations. If you're not used to seeing it, when you sound it out, it's not quite what you think. Yeah, and sometimes it is, but you go, no, it can't be right. It's got to be weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. You trip yourself up. All right, so uh, was that the only comment? Now, Richard wrote in on Discord uh, in response to our last episode and said, I am so impressed that you were able to get Lee as a guest on episode number 47. I've been subscribed to his YouTube channel for several years as he does a great job of explaining various aspects of the hobby. Before building FT planes, I started with building multi-rotors back in 2013-2014, and his channel has been extremely informative. I learned from his podcast that I have similar background to Lee in IT, and like him in retirement, this has been a great hobby as it keeps me involved in some fascinating technology. Also, I don't like peanut butter either. What? I don't understand people that don't like peanut butter, but it's cool. (laughs) <laughs> that's okay <clears throat> you know everybody has their thing that they enjoy i'm sure uh if you started asking me about things that you loved i go nah no way what i know what you're crazy so, so that's okay. yeah no richard we're extremely uh thankful for lee coming on and um it it continues to surprise us every time we ask somebody uh hey would you like to yeah. you know blow two hours and give it to us and they yeah, go it's... sure Oh, okay. Right. And then you got people, you know, like Red, who's like, no, I'll come on. any. It's all good. I'm excited. Yeah, let's do it. Like, yeah. Again? Like, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it was four hours the previous time. Yeah, I'll give you another three. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny. Man, like, man right. that's awesome. You, it, it blows me away every time how generous some people can be with their knowledge and with their time. And I think it comes down to a passion for this section of, you know, <clears throat> section of the industry in general, like aviation period, let alone, you know, the hobby side of the aviation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've got Red, who he just announced officially that he's getting his plane done. That's all that. And it is incredible. So I urge you to go take a look at that. But, but you know, the same kind of thing. Like, it's just that passion that, like, if you love it, obviously you're doing it. Maybe you're doing an RC. It doesn't matter. The fact is you love aviation. That's enough for me. Come, let's, let's do some things. Let's share some knowledge. Let's have some fun. Mm-hmm. That's good stuff. So, well, good. Well, well that's it as far as uh, feedback or comments went. Okay. And in response to, or as a follow-up to uh, Michael uh, talking about possibly making it out to a build night, we do have a build night coming up. Um, okay. This is... It, it'll be the coming Friday, right, from when this gets released, right? It will be, yeah. Um, I, I guess we still had uh, our March one in here on our notes because it threw me. But yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, April 22nd, Friday night, mm-hmm. April 22nd, uh, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard? Yeah. Eastern Daylight, whatever it is. Eastern, right now. I think it's officially Eastern Daylight. I don't, hold on. Time.gov should tell me these things. Go ahead. It should. Keep going. All right. Um, and then it, you're projecting, we'll see how it, how it goes. Uh, you're projecting a, a follow-up build night on the 6th or the 13th. It's Eastern uh, Daylight Time. All right, we're in daylight. Okay. We are officially in Eastern Daylight Time. I will stop getting it wrong. I apologize. No, For everybody who shows up an hour, <laughs> one way or the other, I don't know if it's ahead or back. I can't even keep it straight. It's like watching, um, no, I can't think of the name of the movie, the one where it goes backwards in time and you have to, if you have to, 
if you ever rewind the movie to go to the previous part in the movie, but it's forward in the story and it's so confusing. I get lost. Hmm. I, g- I gave up. Memento. That's the one. Okay. Anyway, it's a good movie. Really awesome. Just good luck if you have to go back and try to rewatch part of it. Good luck hmm. finding them. <laughs> um. So, yeah, I mean, no, so we, we got we the build night. Since that one. Yeah, I was looking to see, uh, did, because you had mentioned a previous one from March 25th. Yeah, I don't did know we, why. Did we not talk about that one last episode? I don't know. No, we, I, did. No, we did. That was the point of we it. Did. We talked about how it was a good time. Yeah. Um, and we urge everybody to join us at the next one, which was the 22nd. Um, and also, hey, look, if you are itching for a sim night, and we haven't done one in a while, um, if you don't mind, get on the Discord server. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. Um, and uh, just come out and, and just drop us a line. And we have a sim server and just say, hey, man, you know, when are we going to all sim together? And uh, I think Joe and I will see those and we'll, we'll just pick a day and we'll yeah, do it. Specifically flag at Foamy DM or at Joe. Um, Goose. Are you Goose no, there? It, no, it's Joe. Okay. Um, so specifically uh ping us at foamy at joe um that way we'll see that because mm-hmm. uh, there can be a lot of chatter so we try to keep up with it but we don't always see, okay. see everything and uh and likely we will probably in about like two or three weeks we're gonna do or probably about two two episodes worth so i guess three or four weeks uh we're gonna do a follow-up build night too so mm-hmm. after the 22nd it'll be about mid-month next month look for it uh, we'll do a second follow-up one to finish up whatever we didn't get finished uh, this past, this coming Friday. Okay. Yeah. All right. You want to give us a bri- brief, not so brief history of quads before we get into our main topic? Uh, yeah. Uh, it'll probably be the main topic, and the, the main topic will be the smaller part of the two, probably. <laughs> but, uh, but that's okay. It's uh, the history of the quads. The first, you know, where did the, when did people start the, trying out quadcopters? Because I mean, ultimately, you think, hmm, well, if I've got a propeller and it does this stuff, you know, people have been trying to do a helicopter. It's like, well, that's unstable. But what if I have more of them and I could kind of balance them? Would, would I be able to, like, you know, should I be able to fly that way? And so uh, people have been trying that this since really since before powered powered flight that uh, the powered controlled flight. Really? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, just right after, technically, because okay. I'm trying to think Wright Brothers flew when was it 1903? Well, didn't uh, who was it? Was it Arch- Archimedes or so? One of those guys way back there that used to draw all the crazy engineering stuff. It wasn't it's not there Archimedes. Like a- His principle was was on displacement. Oh, uh, you're talking Michelangelo. Was that Michelangelo? Yeah, man. Oh man. Like yeah, no. Me. Don't get me wrong. Like flight and man, you know, like a gliding flight was definitely and and the ideas of power flight had been around for a long time since since the Renaissance for sure and probably earlier if the records were better. I think we would have been able to figure that out. Um, but uh, anyway, so that. I'm trying to look up the Wright Brothers flight time. I don't know why that never sticks in my head. I want to say it was 1906. But... Yeah, what, why don't we know this off the top of our head? But, yeah, 1903. Okay. Oh, 1903. Man. So I did have it right. Ha! Yeah. Okay, sorry, guys. <laughs> so the first flight was in 1903. So short, short scant, scant years afterwards, uh, the first heavier than air... Aerodyne, Aerodyne, uh, it was the first one to take off vertically, was a four-rotor helicopter designed by Louis Breguet. It's French, so there's, I'm, I'm not pronouncing the T at the end, but it could be Breguet, um, but I think it's French, so you don't do that. Uh, it was tested uh, only in tethered flight and to an altitude of only a few feet in 1908. It was reported to have flown several times although the details, of course, are sparse. And there's a picture of this thing, and it is, I'll call it, it looks like pretty much a monster of bi-wings uh, yeah. attached around these, like, thin, lightweight arms that have a central motor and a bunch of, like, pulleys and wheels to get them to all spin. Um, 
it kind of makes me think of a uh, of an X wing without mm-hmm. the fuselage, really. Oh yeah, fair if enough. You put, yeah, if, if you put props on each of the wingtips. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, except it goes uh, up. Yeah, uh, down instead of I got you forward. Yeah, yeah I got you. Yeah, I, I'm following you. Um, then later in the 1920s, uh, Etienne uh, Omikin, Omikin, it's a, a nationality I couldn't even place right now. Mm. Uh, experimented with rotorcraft designs in the 1920s, and among those designs he tried, his helicopter number two had four rotors and eight propellers. Uh, all driven by a single engine. So you had like a, an engine in the center and a ton of pulleys and these giant, I mean, they're pretty, pretty big propellers. Um, anyway, the angle of these blades could all be varied by warping. Uh, five of the, let's see, still two, let's see, all driven by a single engine. The two had a still tube frame with two bladed, two bladed rotors at the ends of four arms. The angles of these blades could be varied. Five of the propellers spinning in the horizontal plane stabilized the machine laterally. And another propeller was mounted at the nose for steering. So I guess that was they would spin, you know, clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on if you want to go forward or backward. Or or I guess they could vary the pitch by warping it. So it well, could warp to go forward or, or back. So and that it would actually rotate. That that one was for, it was saying that one was for steering. So it seemed like that one was engaged or disengaged. Much like a uh, tail rotor. It's sort of, yeah, except it was sort of out in front. If you look at the picture down below there, you see these four giant propellers that obviously have wing warping. And then way out on the right side of that picture is this little tiny prop. Mm-hmm. And it's got a little tiny, like, rotor hub. And then on the back side where the guy sits. Um, so he's sort of facing that little prop in the front. And I think they, they controlled the pitch on that to go left or right. It seems so for steering. Uh, anyway, it remained um, the remaining pair of propellers functioned as its forward propulsion. So it had, I guess, what four or five going up, two going forward, and one going backwards or forwards that would that would steer it left or right. So well, it was so it was four, four up, and then eight doing other things because. That's what caught me when you were first going through that. Oh, four rotors first... and eight propellers. Yeah, it's four rotors, which are specifically the lifting body ones, like your helicopter. Yeah. And then eight propellers. And then those propellers were all doing different things from stabilization to turning to actual Seems so complex. movement. Yeah, Seems all driven by a single motor. All driven by a single motor with Jeez. a series of pulleys. And it's like this metal tube, lightweight, very lightweight structure, um, considering how you know how big it is, right? Okay, so the aircraft exhibited a considerable degree of stability and an increase in control accuracy for its time. It made over a thousand test flights in the middle of the nineteen during the middle of the nineteen twenties. By 23, 1923, it was also able to remain airborne for several minutes at a time. Um, on April fourteenth, nineteen twenty four, it established the first ever uh, the uh, established the first ever FAI, which is the Federation. Uh, Aeronautique Internationale. So it, it was officially documented as as being in the air for a certain amount of time. The distance recorded for the helicopters of 360 meters, which is 390 yards, uh, it demonstrated the ability to complete a circular course. And later, it completed the first one kilometer or 0.62 mile closed circuit flight by a rotorcraft. Hmm. So it it broke records on that day. Um, so that was one of those, and these are just basically rotorcraft of note up until the point where we get to basically the, you know, world war is kind of where world war two is where I kind of stopped. Okay. Um, more or less Dr. George, uh, Bethesda and Ivan Jerome, uh, developed a Depothosa helicopter, which is the six blade, six bladed rotors at the end of an X shaped, X shaped structure. Which so that's been pretty consistent throughout the whole development of rotorcraft here. Mm-hmm. Two small propellers with variable pitch were used for thrust and yaw control, much like the one we talked about before. Uh, the vehicle used collective pitch controls, um, and it was built by the U.S. Air Service. It was made made its first flight on October 
1922. About 100 flights were made by the end of 1923. And the highest it ever reached was about 5 meters, or 16 and a half feet. Uh, although demonstrating uh, feasibility, it was underpowered, unresponsive, mechanically complex, and susceptible to reliability problems. So um, the pilot uh, workload was too high during the hover to attempt any lateral motion. So you had to work really hard at keeping it level to get it before you can even get it going anywhere, mm -hmm. it seems. And, you know, 16, basically 16 and a half feet doesn't sound terribly high. It's still but... dangerous. Well, that's the, that's a height at which if if it comes down uncontrolled, like you're gonna have problems anyway. So mm -hmm. they likely could have gotten it higher, I would imagine, because yeah. atmosphere doesn't doesn't like lose density. Quite Not that, that quick. quickly. No, yeah, you, you got to so, get a good thousand feet to really start feeling it. I think. Yeah, so they likely could have gone higher, but that was probably the safest height they were willing to to operate mm -hmm. at. I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's in true military fashion. Honestly, when you look at a lot of, um, the, even the, the later era, we're kind of like 1970s, 1980s, when they were doing the UFO-style UFO single turbine, you know, kind of vertical lifting craft. When they took those off, they only ever got off the ground by maybe 10 feet. They were just trying to prove the concept. And mm -hmm. at 10 feet, you know... It's out of ground effect, or it was it was whatever it was was high enough to be out of ground effect, and then at that point you can test controls, and you're not making it so crazy dangerous that whoever was in it was going to be you know killed in the process. Because right. you want those pilots, darn it, <laughs> <laughs> those people are important. So then we get into um, probably some of the first more like truly successful and almost functional craft. Um, and this is like in the post-war era. So this is where we're starting to get, uh, it's, you know, we're already into the 1920s. Um, we go into the war, we come out of the war, learning a heck of a lot about, you know, aerodynamics and the aeronautic uh, industry, right? And so people were trying to figure out ways, uh, I guess, to be more precise with getting people to and from places, right? Mm -hmm. So they did, they uh, the next kind of innovation was the Converter Wings Model A Quadrorotor. It's intended to be the prototype for a line of a much larger civil and mil military copters, uh, helicopters. The design featured two engines driving four rotors through a system of V-belts. Um, no tail rotor was needed, and the controls were obtained by varying the thrust in each of the rotors. It, it was flown many times in 1956. This helicopter proved that the quad rotor design, uh, that it was viable, and it was also the first four rotor helicopter to dem demonstrate successful forward flight. Due to a lack of, uh, of orders for commercial or military versions, however, the project was terminated. Converter Wings proposed that the Model E would have had a max maximum weight of 42,000 pounds, 19 tons, with a payload of 10,000 pounds, or about five tons. Um, over 300 miles, at, which it could carry over 300 miles at up to 137 miles an hour, or 278 kilometers per hour. 173. Did I say, what did I say? 137. Nope, there you go, dyslexia. Yep, Thank you so much. dyslexia kicking in. Man, alive. Okay, anyway, 173 miles an hour. It's even faster. Yeah, that's, that's moving pretty good. Yeah, man, that's a good move. Um, granted, at this point, right, uh, Airplanes are getting towards sonic speeds, transonic. Yeah, but you're still talking about a it's, rotor craft. Yeah, it's a quad. Yeah, it's a quadcopter basically. <laughs> um, okay, th so the Hanson elastic articulated bearingless rotor. That's a handful. That's a mouthful of marbles. Um, uh, bearingless rotor grew uh, uh, grew out of work done in early 1960s at Lockheed, uh, California, by Thomas F. Hanson who had previously worked at Converter Wings in the Quadrotor's design and control systems. Um, so that was kind of born out of a previous project, and, and obviously there's some good that came of it. Like, it, obviously these motors uh, were something that were quality, and they used that later. Um, then we got to another one. The Gloucester Crop Sprayer, Sprayer Project of 1960s was an earlier example of a, quad, a quadcopter drone to be powered by a 105 horsepower Potez 4E air-cooled flat four-cylinder engine 
its 20 gallon payload was discharged through a 22 foot spray boom. Two operators carried homing beacons at opposite ends of the spray run so that the quadcopter would always home in on the beacon and never overshoot. However, despite the much simplified design, the operational requirements compared uh, compared to a piloted machine, um, the parent company uh, board refused to develop it and it remained on a paper project. So the idea was it truly was going to be an autonomous drone mm. to be able to spray crops. And all you had to do is have two people walking on either end of the field and just have it go back and forth. Mm. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, let's see, there's the Curtis Wright, and I think I actually saw a version, one of the first versions of this at the New England Air Museum. So go ahead and look at their website because um, I believe they have a copy, uh, a, a model of the, or not a model, they have one of the versions of the Curtis Wright VZ. This one's a VZ7 VZ is what we're going to talk about. I think they have a, one of the versions of it. Um, so the Curtis Wright VZ7 was uh, 1948. It was a VTOL aircraft designed by Curtis Wright in competition for the U.S. Army Transport and Research Command Flying Jeep. The VZ7 was controlled by changing the thrust of each of the four de- ducted fan rotors. The... Um, so that that was, I guess that's the one. And then there's one more, which is basically kind of getting a hybrid between a uh, rotorcraft and a blimp. So the the next one would be a Pizek PA-97. Pizeki, sorry. I forgot the I at the end. Um, it was a proposal for a, a large hybrid aircraft, which was four helicopter fuselages, and then they were combined with a lighter-than-air airship in the 1980s. And the project tragically ended with the loss of one of the pilots and during four other people as well, uh, pretty much ended the project. So, hmm. but yeah, I mean, if you look at the picture down below, like it's literally like four helicopters just cobbled together in a 3d space frame hung below a good sized blimp. Hmm. So I guess to create something that was a little bit more agile and a lot more, you know, cause blimps seem to just be very slow uh, I'd imagine it's a pretty easy target. Yeah. I imagine with the four rotors, it'd be a little bit more agile and a little bit faster. So, mm-hmm. so we'll see. Anyway, but th- that's just some of the histories of some of the earliest quadcopters. And up until some of the bigger advances in control systems and the, the speed at which they can compute the differences in motor speeds, and the ability to control, fine-tune control the motor speeds, I mean, really, um, they really haven't been a, a terribly viable option for the most part. It doesn't seem. Because um, yeah. it, it's been tried again and again and again since man flight started. And uh, only recently has it become pretty effective. Okay. Well, you you got through that faster than I thought you would. I didn't. Um, it's a lot of material, but it's, you know, it's pretty basic. Yeah. Um, so while you were continuing on through mm-hmm. um, that, the the uh, Convertible Wing Model A okay. quadcopter, you yeah. were talking about its payload uh, and its, its uh, speed. Yes. Um, so that was in the, that was a quadcopter, what, in the 1960s? Yep, 1956, it's, actually. Okay, uh, and that was getting up to up to 173 miles an hour. Correct. So I did some looking. Uh, the and the two the two helicopters that come to mind <coughs> are the uh, the Boeing AH-64 Apache mm-hmm. the Apache attack hel- helicopter. Okay. And the uh, Boeing CH-47, the Chinook. Okay, right, and the, that's that's the payload workhorse, right? The Chinook. Yeah. So the the Chinook was the two pro, uh, two rotor the the rear rotor was elevated mm-hmm. over the front elevator because uh, the front rotor because they overlapped. Yep. So this was not the the Sky Crane, oh, right? Uh, and it and it wasn't the one that sits down over the um, uh, over the like the ca- uh, outdoor canisters, the giant sure yeah like, the... railroad car things. Mm-hmm. So the, it's not this one that lands on those and picks them up, but it, it's the Chinook. Okay. Uh, which was a uh, troop transport, but it could also have a bunch of stuff swung under it. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so the 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 uh, converter wing, you're saying 173 mile an hour was probably its top speed. The cruise speed of the Apache helicopter was 165 miles an hour. Okay. Um, and it's never exceed speed was 227. So it could get up to that, but. Okay. But yeah, um, it's, that's okay. So that's comparable to what was being developed at the time, I guess. Yeah. And I know the, the Apache is much later, but at the same point, a lot of, a lot of that tech was being developed around then. Mm-hmm. And I I didn't know this. The earliest Apaches were built in the uh, in 1975. Okay. Um. So now, did those top speeds apply back then? Because it's the 764 AD. Uh, and the original was just 64. Those. It's those probably stand- pretty close though. Yeah. And then the Chinook. Well, what was um, the, what was the payload? Did did it, any information on the payload of the? I know it's a different it's a different workload. It's a different type of. Yeah, the it's Apache's um, not designed to lift a bunch. Uh, its empty weight was eleven thousand pounds. Its max takeoff was twenty three thousand. Okay, so it had a ten thousand pound usable load payload. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's comparable to what this so, is. Five ton, yeah. Mm. And then your Chinook, uh, your Chinook could get. Let's see, its cruise speed was one hundred eighty four miles an hour. Okay, uh, two hundred ninety six kilometers an hour. And it's uh, it's empty weight. Let's see, empty weight twenty about twenty five thousand pounds. As max takeoff was fifty thousand. So that's okay. twenty five thousand pound, um, twelve and a half ton. Right, uh, double the payload, but not a whole lot more speed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow, that's cool. That's good reference points. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Now I will say the Chinook. Uh, the Chinook's first flight was 1961. Okay. So, so. five years later. Mm-hmm. Nice. Cool. Well, I mean, that's that's quadcopters in a nutshell. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure that's pretty much what we saw up to about the 80s. And then you know, I think if you saw it today, there would certainly be a, a – it would branch out quite considerably past 2000. You know, uh, we there wasn't a whole lot of information on that part. And I figured, you know, that's more modern history, if at all. Mm-hmm. So, so well, like, still, still applies. Yeah. Well, I guess that brings us that pretty much ends that segment. So I guess we're now to our main topic. What in the heck do we do when we get out there and go? Oh no, I can't fly a plane here. Yeah, and let's. I guess we'll specifically say because weather conditions, specifically windy. Hmm. Um. Because I've gotten out there and realized I left my batteries behind, <laughs> or I left my transmitter behind. Yeah. And I guess in some ways what we're going to talk about is going to meet with that. I mean, if you have these other things, you go, well, I ain't going back for that. Well, I do have these other things. Mm-hmm. I could still have fun. Um, so, I mean, it could be a good alternate, but at the same point. Yeah. Um, one of the things I would top, I guess my top suggestion, especially if it's too windy, bring a kite. Yeah, I know it seems, seems silly, but bring a kite. We rarely have the good sustained wind for a kite down here, but you're right. You know, I mean, if it, if it's that kind of wind, the kite is the perfect thing to have with you. Yeah. When I was younger, we had dad, mom and dad got me a, uh, a two string kite. Oh so I, yeah. So I had Stunts. to handle it. Yep. I could do the, yep. <laughs> I always dreamed I'd be amazing at it. I wasn't. <laughs> I could do a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but I always thought I'd be uh, be great. But anyway, yeah, that, I I just I used to spend I can't tell you how many hours running across my backyard as a kid, getting trying the kite, to get it in the well, air, trying to get it past the tree line because I knew mm. once I got it in the tree line, I could let that thing out. I I swear to God, the thing must have been over my school about a mile away. I don't know how high the thing was up. It was it was crazy. It was like a little dot in the sky. <laughs> it took forever to reel back. Oh in. my God, it did. Yeah, because I had the. It's not like I had like a reel or any kind of mechanism that would make it easy. Nope. I had to like wind it around. <laughs> yep. I had the spool with two handles on each side, oh, just yeah. the, the rod that went through. Yeah. 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 And you're like, uh, and then once in a while you'd like let go because your hands got tired. And you're like, no, uh-huh. <laughs> I have to go. I just took an hour to do that. Oh, man. But yep. yeah. Yeah. And then you always have the tree. Anyway, but bring a kite. 
Uh, get and that nowadays, I mean, like you're older than you used to be, you can afford more than a ten dollar kite. You can get some really cool, colorful, fun kites. You can. There's a whole world about building kites, and you know that could be the other part of your hobby is build a kite. And and those days, it's kind of rough. You get out to the field, and you, you're not the only one there. Sometimes I've gone out and there's been like, yeah, it's too windy. I'm not going to fly. And we're like, oh, okay. Um, and if you went and had a couple of kites, you'd be like, hey, man, you want to go fly a kite? I got a couple of kites here. Um, you know, you just sit and just watch and talk and have a good time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing you could do is we were ta- just talking about quadcopters. You could bring out a quadcopter. So not every quadcopter is going to be suitable for this. Right, some quadcopters are not able to handle the wind, but there a lot of the five inch quads are powerful enough. They're the racing quad style. They're powerful enough that they'll power through anything. Um, it, you know, the wind will just add a little fun kind of twist to it. So bring one of the quadcopters out and just do that for a little while. You're not going to upset anybody. It's not like anybody who's using pulse or foam is going to be out there in their right mind, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you put a couple gates up maybe or you, you cut, put a couple sticks up that you can go around and you just go fly that for a little bit. Um, and in that similar vein, go ground and bring out RC cars. Or if you've got a lake out there, bring a, bring a boat. I guess sailboat, if you have an RC sailboat, whew, that might be perfect wind for it. I wonder how many people have RC boats. I don't know. I don't know. I know we've got like a lake way out in the corner of the place. It's mm-hmm. not a lake. It's a quarry. It's a filled quarry. But um, yeah, I you know, I don't know. Um, they're fun. You can use the same foam. You know, same balsa. Most of the stuff is done in a very similar fashion. The only yeah. difference is you're doing using one or two servos for one for rigging and one for like a rudder. And they have to be a little bit stronger because you're Pushing it's water and wind, and not, not like a. It's just a little different. You're, you, the water's a lot heavier mm-hmm. to to push around, I guess. But yeah, you can get into you know do have even if it's just like well I'm going to try a boat and you have it with you and then you go oh it's it stinks it's raining or it's too windy like well if you got a lake there go ahead yeah you know um, when you bring cars like bring cones make a race of it or. You know, bring some jumps, something to have some fun with. So those are just things to remember to bring with you when you do that. If if you have a couple, like if you have a small one, just always have that in your car. You char- when you're charging up the batteries, charge a battery that'll get used in that one too. Like usually three cell, they take three cells. 20, 2200 isn't off, you know, unusual. You just bring that with you so that way you have it if you need it. Especially if you bust all your planes like I do sometimes. Yeah, you have an early day. You're like, ah, oh, <laughs> darn it. Well, you pull out the RC car and go, you know, behind the line, you know, uh, behind the pits and just go goof around. So, um, Of course, you can just hang with your other field mates. If you're out there with other people, um, if you're going out to your, your club field, you probably, you may not be the only one out there. Um, so go hang, chat. Get to know them. Um, get to ask them, you know, what are they up to? You know, what are they building? You have advice or, you know, whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. It's use that time to to get to know, you know, people who do the same stuff you do. Um, you could also design a new plane. Come up with an idea. Jot it down. Um, maybe maybe you decide you get out there and you go, well, I'm going to go home. We well, go home and, and draw something out. Um, drop a couple sketches, get some dimensions, you know, and then, of course, start building it. Um, you could always join us on discord. You go, Oh my God, it's too windy. And you take a picture of the sock and post it to us. And yeah, I'm sure you'll get at least 10 comments of people going, Oh, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, fly it anyway. <laughs> That's probably what people will say. Yeah. Don't follow that advice. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Um, you could also simulate. So go, go get your favorite sim. Um, if you want to uh, join us in the discord and say, Hey, it's really windy where I'm at. Who, who else wants to sim? I, I, I need to fly. I need mm-hmm. to practice, you know, and then go do that. And then you can have a good day at the field, yet you won't have to worry about the wind. Yeah, we've had some guys do some impromptu sim parties. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. That's good. I'm really happy to see that. Hope we get to see more of it, too. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, another thing is if you've got like a slope sorter, 
plane that you don't get an opportunity to fly, that's the kind of weather for slope soaring. I mean, that's what essentially slope soaring is, is a, a good, steady, almost hard breeze. And if you have a plane that's kind of, I'll call it a heavy plane that's still balanced and flies, you know, pretty well. That's I, I took um, the simple soar on a on a windy day that I probably shouldn't have flown it. Right <laughs> on a normal day, it would fly great, like it just gets up in the air and you just float around for a while. But like this was a windy day. This was one of those days where a storm was coming, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden went from fine to like, oh no, <laughs> this is yeah. dangerous. Well, I got the you know I lit I took it off. And it was basically not really going anywhere. That's kind of the, the amount of headwind it had. So I'm like, well, what if I fly this as a sloper? And I literally just went back and forth across the field, across the you know, perpendicular or parallel with the, would that be perpendic- perpendicular to the air, you know, airflow, right? So I kind of mm-hmm. go back and forth. And I just did that a while, you know, and had a good time with it. I'd go up and I'd come down and get a little bit of speed and get ahead and I'd, yeah, you know, come around and I fall back a little bit and just kind of be practicing. It's kind of a fine line about where that's fun and where it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but you can certainly practice slope soaring if you've, I mean, if you're like me and you've seen it on Flight Fest where they kind of show you different spots or, or you follow Andrew Newton, who he must, I think he lives like right behind the perfect slope soaring site <laughs> in, what was that? I think he's in Australia. I don't know. I don't know where he's at, but he's on that end of the world. If it's not there, it's New Zealand or Auckland or something like that. Anyway, so, but I mean, he he just takes whatever ridiculous plane he has and goes out, and it's just a beautiful slope soaring site. And uh, he's always doing that stuff. And so you just practice slope soaring. That's the kind of conditions that you see slope soaring. So that's a good that's a good excuse to go try that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, here's another thing. If you can't go out and fly, just take that take that time to go through the planes you thought you were going to fly and just double check they're ready. Mm-hmm. And get them to the point where they're ready. Like I don't know how many times I've gone out and went, I'm this one's ready. And then I go, Oh, it's not. Like I gotta go fix this or do the tweak on this, or let me check the motor direction or or you know, I gotta check my electronics. Yeah, so I'll I'll jump in on this one because I was gonna see if you were gonna cover it. Um and you, you've kind of touched on it. There are plenty of times when I will say, my plane is ready to go. And it is. I could chuck it in the air and probably get it to fly. Yeah. Uh, but there are some niceties that would be nice to have set up that you don't necessarily <laughs> always have set up when you're, hey, I got to get this thing out to the field, which would be, I like to have a throttle cut off on mm-hmm. all my models. Oh, boy, you should have it on there. Mm-hmm. So I flip a switch. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. You know, we, you and I have said it a hundred times before. That belly gets in the way. It hits that throttle. Yep. Yeah. Um, Expo. Not that I use a bunch of it, but if you want Expo, have, having a little bit. It. Yeah, having a little bit of it actually, it it really is a great way to fine tune your flight. Mm-hmm. You know, and then take time to set up uh, different amounts of Expo. So. Mm-hmm have a toggle or a three position or which, however you want to do it where you've got, say your takeoff and your fancy or your easy fly and precision flying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had that with a spitfire. I've had it with the foggy where mm-hmm. I chuck it and I've got low rates and high rates essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's really, especially if you've got multiple planes that are set up with different throws, Sometimes I'll throw one plane and the high rates are what I need, right? Mm-hmm. Because I've set it up that way. And then I get to the next plane and it's the same control system and they work fine, but the throws are much bigger on it. So I need to dial back the throws. And so if <laughs> if I keep it in the high rates, it's going to be awful. <laughs> so I bring it down to medium or, or low rates and all of a sudden I'm able to fly it fine and have a good time. Uh, one example is I think I had... Um, mini scout. I, I made one of the mini scouts kind of from the gothic gaggle thing. I made one and it, it flew great, but it needed to be on low settings and I never went back to adjust it. But as long as I had it on the rates and I could switch it to low and it was fine. If I made the mistake of trying to fly it on high, it, it was squirrely. <laughs> yeah. So take the time to set up the transmitter, right? Cause I, I've done that before where I get out there to fly and the first 45 minutes is spent 
setting up the transmitter because I didn't mm-hmm. do it. You know, setting up the, the transmitter at the plane, getting, let me go ahead and program this stuff. So I lose that fly time, but I'm taking the time to do it. So if yeah. it's too windy to fly, take go the through time it. To, yeah, go through it and say, you know what? I kind of want to figure out how to do this thing. This is a feature that I'd mm-hmm. love to have on this plane. You know, whether it be flapper ons or dual rates and all that. Mm-hmm. And then YouTube how to YouTube how to do it for your transmitter. And chances are, Painless 360 might have a video on it. Yeah, yeah, he, would, <laughs> and he has an excellent video on it. Um, uh, he just, uh, it's part of why we brought him on because when I've watched his videos, I, did, I felt like he went the speed I needed to for me to understand it and follow along. Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't take forever. I wasn't like, oh my God, would you please move? forward with this <laughs> you know what i mean because there's there's a there's a certain pace that seems about right he seems to hit it mm-hmm. um yeah absolutely um yeah the, the, excellent um you could also fly at dawn or dusk where the wind isn't going to be as high um you know so basically it's as the wind or as the sun heats the earth um that's when thermals get created when thermals get created wind starts happening Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when you get the windy days. And so in dawn, before the sun heats the earth, it's going to be, it's going to be light enough to fly, but it's going to be, wind is going to be really low. Same with dusk. So just, um, I urge you that if that's the plan, uh, get some, get some directional lighting, but have some directional lighting on there just in case. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which I found is basically, a uh, red and a green light and a white light and a headlight. You know? Okay. So when you can see it coming at you, like, whoa, that's coming at me. And then the other one is like a blinky white light in the back. You only see when it's going away from you. Okay, there's a blinky light. Okay, got it. That's going away from me. And then you go left or and depending on if you see the red or the green or both or, you know, what direction it's coming or going. Because it will be a silhouette at that point some at some point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> whether you're flying it too long into dusk or not. No, not that we have any experience doing no, that. No, we've never done that. Nah, nope. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've we've done it more often than we want to admit. It's but just that's, about every time we've flown together. I know, right? Well, part of it is, you know, we and we talked about it before, is sometimes it's like we get out to the field later than we thought, um, and the winds are really favorable. It's like, oh, finally, the wind's not twisting left and right and left and right and left and right and it's not nope. crazy it's like cool we can finally go fly and just relax and enjoy oh wait everything's a silhouette darn it <laughs> yo yep. this is gonna be hard <laughs> um yeah so yeah do 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 that and you know if you if it is windy you know come back later maybe if you can but i know that some people fly you know they the, their flying site is you know half hour or even an hour away from where they live so you know, going back isn't entirely an option, which is part of the reason why I wanted to cover this is because bring something that you can do in the meantime. Because, yeah. you know, you may be able to wait a couple hours and the wind dies down because it's not midday, you know, and, and then you can fly some and enjoy it. Uh, and I think the last thing is if you are unable to be out there because it's too windy, I think every one of us could use to clean up our bench a little. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know I can right time. now, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I think even though you may be in denial and think, nope, my place is really organized. And there are some people who are very organized. Um, I'm always at a marvel at those people, but uh, everybody can organize a little bit. Well. Yeah. Or clean up. It. You know what? And if you're one of those guys that's just, it's that good, we salute you. The yeah. rest of us blokes have some work to do. Well, good. Well, I guess that brings, so that's really all I had. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, No, I, I kind of inputted the one bit that I did have. Okay. That's good. It was good input. Well, I appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah. So I guess that brings us to our workbench. What are we going to work on in the next little bit? Um, well, I would love to get the electronics actually in the seven, start that process, yes. but that's going to have to, if I do any of that, it'll have to be before the build party. Um, yeah, because we're be, going to pull out Spitfires. Right. And I'm actually looking to be out of town, uh, one of those nights and then 
So I'm actually, normally I would go down and out of state the Thursday and Friday. You're talking about, because this is right before Easter. So it's a holiday weekend this coming weekend. And then the following weekend is probably busy. (laughs) Right. Well, so I'm talking about going out of town for work. Okay. So normally I'll go out of town for, on a Thursday, Friday. That makes sense. But, you know, we planned this one in the far enough ahead. I said, I'll go ahead and go down on Wednesday, Thursday. So I'm not rushing to get back for this one, especially with being the Spitfire one. So, yeah. But I had to figure out, see if I can, uh, set some, some time aside in the evening, uh, to start on electronics. But if nothing else, you know, we got the Spitfire build party. And I did kind of pull the, 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 the plastic bag out and had a look in there. And those parts seem to still be in decent condition. Oh, good. Good. Cause if, did they, I'm trying to remember if they made the trek. Because they made the trek all the way mm-hmm. and back from Ohio well, the, and back again. <laughs> they made the trek to Ohio in your stuff. And then when we got back, as I was packing up to to transfer everything to my mm-hmm. car, I think you grabbed the bag and pulled two sets yeah, out. Yeah, just made sure you had it on the way home. Like, don't forget these. You, you but When you get inspired, I want you to have these. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. That's true. Good. All right, what about you? Well, what? Oh, wait, wait. wait. Yeah, what about that glider? Are you going to get one of them together? Uh, eventually, I'll probably retouch it. Just okay. Pressure's off now. I Didn't know the pressure's off. Well, I'd still like to see you fly it. Well, I I got to see me fly it. Well, where's the video, man? <laughs> Never happened if you don't have no video. I took video, and then it just didn't record, so. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll believe when I see it. Anyway, well, well anyway, no, good. Day. I just I want to I want to see I want to see you fly the seven, and I I want to see uh, I want to see you get that glider back up in the air. I think you'll enjoy it. But anyway, no, I'm I'm looking forward to the Spitfire. So, for me, uh, the Star Voyager thing that that weird uh, deal. I, I want to get that finished up. I'm putting the electronics in that. It's basically kind of mounting the firewall and putting the servos in. Um, so the, it's built. I'll finish out the the tape job on it. So it's got a lot of great color, um, and then I can just tool it around the sky. It'll be fun. I think I'll. I might even get a light set on it just because it'll be fun to. Because it's slow and gentle. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's not a fast flyer. So it's one of those ones you just sit down and relax with it. Um, I would like to get back. Maybe I don't know if I'll be able to do it this week. Although the kids are gone, so I might have some time in the evenings. Um, to really figure out what I need to do to get the bird of time back in the air. Uh, and then of course I'm going to get the P61 in the air. And then of course, you know, we're going to work on the Spitfire next Friday. That's going to be exciting. Yeah. I'm, me too. I'm so excited about that. I've got yeah. servos. I'm like, okay, servos are right here. Okay. That's good. Got that. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, which motors am I going to put in? Well, I don't know. I'm just going to steal motors from other ones. I'll I'll be honest. I will probably pull the motors out of the Sea Duck for now. Oh, hey, did you? Not yet. You sure you don't want to just fly it if it's ready? I mean, you just have to repair the nose. Yeah, but that's that's gonna be some work, and that's two yeah. perfectly good C packs sitting right there. Okay, I see what you're saying. But pull it because it is a is a power pod, so you can just pull the pod out. Mm-hmm. It's not like you're dismantling the entire Sea Duck to get to it. No, I seem to remember the the fit being awfully snug, but I should be able to pull those pods out. You you will. It, it is snug, but it's on purpose. So, yeah, you'll mm. be able to pull them out. That'd be good. Cool. I have not ditched the set. I have not ditched the duck. Just it's it's there. The wings glued back on. It just look. Needs... I'm I'm about to mount that bigger motor on the front of the. Oh my god! Why am I blanking on the Don the Carnage. triplane? Yeah, the Don Carnage plane. Mm. I mean it. It's ready, baby. I didn't know you were. You'd already built it. It's already built, baby. I just need to. I need to get it pretty, and I need to mount the the bigger motor. Um, I think I've been trying to figure out how I was going to mount it to a different pod. Mm-hmm. But as I understand it, it's it's all good. I just I I think I've I've got the pod, and I see the motor over there. So it's just a matter of bringing them together. Maybe that's what I do. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have that ready. And maybe, you know, if if we're lucky, depending on when, the, if the kids are coming back on like Sunday, I might be able to come down for, a, you know, a fly day 
uh, this not this weekend, but next weekend if we get a chance. Okay. And, uh, yeah, well, we'll see. We, you and I will talk and see if we yeah. can do that. But that that's an opportunity potentially. And then I've got uh, the kids leave. Uh, they're done with school at the end of next month, like May 20th or something. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, I'll be a lot more free to come visit uh, if we have the weekends to do it. Yeah, I know well, you're at that gonna... point, we'll just be a month out from Flight Fest. I know. <laughs> we need to make sure all the planes fly and fly well. Yeah. I've got a, I've got, I've got stuff to work on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> on that note, I, I better go getting some things cleaned up so we can get busy on it. So I guess, Joe, you want to bring us out? You do it so well. I lost you for a second. <laughs> Skype messed up. What were you saying? No. <laughs> I, I think I know saying, what you were saying, but I had to be sure. No, I was just like, well, I guess that's it. And then, of course, I it was a blank spot up from you, and I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, okay. No, I was just saying, I think that's it. Uh, you want to bring us out? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, guys, we're going to work on getting out of here as always. Uh, we thank you for tuning in and listening. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we've enjoyed having it. We want to say a special thank you to our patrons, uh, the guys that have signed up uh, to support us a little bit every month, we appreciate it. Um, we really do. It, it lets us know that what we're doing is valued, uh, and while not expected, certainly appreciated. Uh, if you would like to become a patron, head over to patreon.com slash aviationrcnoob, and you can sign up there. If you want to reach out, have comments, questions, uh, topics, something that you'd like Matthew and I to oh, talk yeah. about. Because we, we meant to bring this up during the housekeeping area, but I won't say we're at the bottom of the bucket, but we're getting low in our toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> Things that we could easily talk about. The well's about. getting dry. <laughs> Somebody so, needs to fill the well. I'm uh, just kidding. Hey, look, we, I think what we're coming down to, it's not that all the topics are gone. Um, what I'm noticing is when I look through our topic list, uh, the topic list is starting to require either... Um, a lot more setup, or it requires getting a hold of um, a different type of guest. Where mm-hmm. what I want to start doing is getting hold of manufacturers and things like that. And right now, that's been um, they have not been as gracious as a lot of our previous guests so far. Not to say that they; it's just their process is a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it requires a lot more coordination. So we're still working on some of that stuff. I would like to get a hold of people um, like eFlight and, you know, Buddy RC and things like that. Like where the, you know, people who they have hobby stores. I'd like to talk to them about what what's it like, you know, to do that. Or what's it like to build, you know, design and build a plane. Or what's it like to create a kit, you know, that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. Um, those, those are things that are coming. I know I, I talked to a couple people at Balsa, uh, some Balsa manufacturers, cause I, I, that's one of the things we're going to get to, but those all take a lot more time. And in the meantime, we like to have topics that we kind of fill in. I feel like Joe, we've covered a lot of the core elements that I think we're comfortable covering in the detail we've covered. I feel yeah, like if we so, go too far, much further than we have, we're, I don't know, we're putting on airs that we don't have. I don't want to yeah, do that. Yeah, so there, there would have to be a lot of research, which we don't necessarily mind doing. Uh, but it would certainly be potentially from a position of here's stuff that we know that we really don't know. Um, yeah. You know, and it's without without knowing that somebody specifically wants to know the information, uh, while Matthew and I would love to dive in and talk like grand, granular level, super nitty gritty, uh, that's not always enjoyable to listen to unless there was a question that had been asked. It was specifically being answered as opposed to a broad, uh, deep dive. So, mm-hmm. um, ultimately what I'm getting at there is, if you have a question, if you have a uh, topic that you'd like covered, maybe we've already covered it, but you want it covered in a little more detail, specifically, like ask specifically what you want to hear mm-hmm. about, reach out to us. Because <coughs> th- this isn't just a 
an opening an open invitation to say, oh yes, reach out to us. It is actually a request. Reach out to us and ask us to cover something because mm-hmm. you know we're we may be running a little low on things to talk about, and we don't want the show to be boring. Um, we don't want to just have a rehash over a rehash over and over. So while we're not there, um, you know, give, give us some ideas. Ultimately, help us help you, I think I heard someone say once. Yeah. Jay, um, I would think it was Jerry Maguire. I'm just it? kidding. <laughs> so No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But no, you're right. It's it's exactly what – it's. we want to make sure that we're hitting topics that interest you, our listeners. Um, we, we You know – we don't want to be like part of me would love to talk to museums. Maybe. I don't know if that's an interest to you guys. Um, do you want us to try and talk to like full scale aviation, like vans, right? Like, like a manufacturer or Sonex or something like where it's a kit plane. Like that's kind of what we do in RC, but the RC version, right? Like would what that be interesting? What to them about? It's just how they manufacture planes. So we can see, like, how similar is it? Uh, how many of the people who do that kind of stuff, are they RC hobbyists, enthusiasts? And, you know, what what is Van's role in, you know what I mean? Like, how do, how do they overlap? Is mm-hmm. that interesting? I don't know. Is that interesting to anybody? Maybe it's not. Well, um, it would be to you, but. It is to me. If, but if like it's got a wing on it, it's interesting to you. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope that a lot of our listeners have a similar feeling. Um, but at the same point, that I would love to like, yeah, no, I'm you know, full scale is, is neat and all, but I'd rather hear more about whatever. Um, reach out, let us know. Uh, you can reach out in the email. Uh, you covered that, right, Joe? Not, not yet. Okay. Well, how would they reach out with an email? <laughs> <laughs> or you can reach out in the discord, right? How do they reach out in an email? Okay. I'll, uh, you reach us at aviationrcnoob at gmail.com. You can reach Matthew at Matthew at aviationrcnoob.com. Or you can reach me, Joe, at aviationrcnoob.com. Or you can reach out to us on the Discord. Uh, link will be in the show notes. So it'll say Discord. If you highlight, you can click on that and it'll work on bringing you straight to the server. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can swing by the Facebook page, uh, and drop your question in there. Although, just know, we may not see that one immediately yeah. um, just because of how Facebook, how our page is a page, not a group is handled. Whatever yeah, it is. It's, it's handled differently. It gets put in a page that's like requires, we have to scroll a lot to get to the thing that we want to see. And we don't always get there. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it, it takes a little bit for us to see it, but we, yeah. it's not that we don't want to know. So bear with um, us. I think, I didn't really get to get into my proper rhythm, but I think oh, we've yeah. pretty much closed everything out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, cause you covered the patrons, you covered, uh, where, where to reach out and talk to us, uh, talked about what we, what we need from you. Um, and if there's anything you want to hear from us, let us know. Yeah. That was what that five minutes was about five minutes Good. ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I could repeat, uh, everything. I'm glad you're here for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's almost like I'm useful. Yeah, I think that's a sign. You ready to go? Yeah, I think it is. All right, right, good night. (laughs) Good night. Do you need a few minutes to read through it? Uh, No, it'll be great. Uh, All the natural bumbles will be fantastic. I I think it'll be podcasting gold. See, I don't know who Etten Ochaiman Meekin. See, honestly, like that's a difference between you and me. Like, and, and that's it. That looks like a Omikin. Yeah, but yeah, you're you're right. It probably does have a Och, uh, depending o, on where o, it's from. A Tain Ochamikin. What? But you're right. It's, it's probably Omikin. Well, yeah, I wouldn't want to. I would not try to do the. Oh, in no, case it's, it's not it's even remotely e- that. E- Eden O'Meekin. Uh, uh, whoever it's from. But yeah, we'll, we'll but, go through it. That, I mean, that's the difference in yours and my presentation style, too. Like, yeah. You know, you'll kind of half off the cuff. It, yours is like a mixture of 
off the cuff and directly reading the script from in front of you. I'm like, quit reading off Wikipedia. But then I'll have just little jotted notes and I'm pulling heavily from memory. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, that that's one of the best uh, one of the best ways to not sound scripted is to just take like real brief notes where you're like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to fill in. <laughs> yeah. But, but the problem is with that is you, you may. Yeah. Speak incorrectly. Yeah. You may misspeak a handful of things You're like, oh, I should have grabbed facts on that one. <laughs> mm hmm. Ooh, uh-oh. Let's see if I can share. Don't worry about it. We'll just, we're, we're, we're squirreling. You'll see it. You'll see it. Yeah, we're squirreling. There you go. It'll be there when you need it. Stopping. Oh, we're supposed to record that? <laughs>